thank you all for coming. Uh, is the mic volume and everything okay? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, my name's Walt Fultz. Uh, folks who already know me know me through my website, Missouri Traveler. Uh, I've been uh, guiding in Missouri for 16 or 17 years now. I also take a group to Alaska every summer, or, well, every September. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons why I'm here, uh, or actually the primary reason why I'm here this weekend is because Missouri Trout Fishermen's Association invited me to come up to, to, to speak. And I thought, well, you know, okay, that sounds like fun, and since I'm there, I might as well get a booth. So, uh, but be sure to check, uh, check out their booth. They're on the back wall over there. Uh, they, uh, they've got four chapters in Missouri, Kansas City, St. Louis, Branson, and Springfield made, uh, they do a lot of fundraising for some really good causes, so make sure you go in there and check them out. They'll have some, uh, these guys have some fly flying demonstrations going on still today, too, so uh, make sure you go in there and check them out. Uh, and then I also have a booth out there, so you'll have to come out and try to track them down. Uh, the, the guy right to the right of us when you're looking at us is giving away free outdoor magazines, so if you don't come see me, you can get a free magazine, so and I'll latch on to you and talk to you while you're doing it. Um, okay, so today's presentation is called Be the Trout, and it's, uh, it's basically the idea behind it is that uh, when, when people first learn to trout fish, at least in our part of the country, they usually start off learning how to fish for warm water fish, and then they try to add trout onto their menu, and, and it's kind of hard to make sense of how different trout are than, say, bass or catfish or trout or, or whatever. And, uh, and so we have a, most folks have kind of a hard time making that, that cognitive switch, so we're going to kind of talk about some of that stuff. But before we really get into the meat of that part of the presentation, something that I learned a few years back is that when, when, uh, when I would get to the point where I was uh, encouraging questions, most of the questions uh, would be about how did I become a guide, when, when did I start doing this, when did I start doing that. So I decided that it's a good idea to start off by just answering some, uh, some, some of those questions in advance about myself, kind of let you know who I am and how I got to this point. So that's where we're going to start. So when I was a kid, uh, I lived in Waynesville, Missouri, and we didn't have cable. And, uh, and every Sunday afternoon, you could watch uh, on TV, there'd be some sort of little comedy like Laurel and Hardy or Adam Costello or something like that. And then there'd be like a Ron Ely, Tarzan sort of you know show on or, uh, or a John Wayne Western of some sort. Well, this one particular Sunday when I was about eight or nine years old, uh, The Quiet Man was on. John Wayne, I think we have a program that thought John Wayne's got to be a Western, but it's not. He's an ex prize fighter that moves back to Ireland uh, because he kills a guy in the ring. So he goes back to Ireland and tries to live a life of peace. And uh, Maureen O'Hara is his uh, love-hate relationship person, which is you know, kind of a standard role you know, in the movies at that time. So she goes to find the town, pre the town priest to try to get advice from him about why she hates him, but she loves him, and what should she do, and all that kind of stuff. And as you can see, he's fly fishing while she's shouting in his ear. And he hooks into a, a salmon about yay big and loses it. And so, of course, he's mad at her completely. He didn't lose it on his own. Well, as an eight or a nine year old kid, what I took away from that is I need to get this magic fishing pole because that's the only way that you get big fish. And so I nagged my mom until she got me a Walmart special uh, eight foot fiberglass rod that must have cost or must have weighed about you know a pound and a half. I had one of those spring loaded automatic reels. I don't know if you ever saw those. You have to crank them up and then you push the reel, push the button, and pipe the fish for you. Awesome. And I accidentally caught a fish uh, on a fly rod on the Ruby Dew Creek. I have no idea how I did it, but I was doomed from that point on. Uh, so ever since then, I've been uh, learning as much as I can and getting better at it as much as I can. So everybody goes through this process. And yours is a little bit different than mine, I'm sure. But the step, step one of that process is I just want to catch a fish. I got, my, I got my rod, I got my bait, I want to catch a fish. Once you get past that, then there's you know, additional steps. And some of these are going to look familiar to you. Uh, some of them are going to look weird because I'm weird. Uh, the next step is I want to fill my freezer. That one probably looks pretty pretty classic. I filled my freezer. I filled my grandparents' freezer, my aunts and uncles' freezers, my neighbors' freezers, strangers. I was giving strangers fish. It was kind of ridiculous. I just caught as many fish as I could. Uh, the funny thing is that I don't even really like the taste of trout. Boy, I ate an awful lot of trout between about age 9 and 11. That's kind of about almost, almost all I ate. Trout and potato chips and candy. I think it was my entire diet. And of course, once you get over that, you get more than that, now you want to catch something big. And over the years, I figured out that uh, it's more than just a numbers game. You can, you can target big fish. You just got to figure out how they behave differently than the little fish. And you change your tactics a little bit. And you just go out and you change one and you catch it. 
But eventually you kind of get tired of that too, once you kind of get the hang of it and you kind of begin to see how that's done. So then you start wanting to experience something different, something new, something exciting. That could be anything. It could be adding new, you know, aspects to the sport. It could be going new places. Uh, I started off by tying my own flies. Uh, the first fish I ever caught on my own fly was a rainbow trout that I caught on a uh, hare's ear nymph. And I did not have the, the, turkey, the turkey feather for the shell back. So the shell back was actually masking tape where I took a, uh, a magic marker and I put the little dots on it. With the magic marker. And I remember that fly very, very clearly. And I remember that fish really clearly too. Uh, and I, I thought it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I also uh, took some time to learn how to do taxidermy, which, by the way, it's an awesome hobby. As soon as you start trying to learn, earn a living from it, it immediately sucks. Uh, <laughs> so that's my, that's my advice to you uh, aspiring taxidermists out there. I started targeting wild fish. So I used to have friends with me. I, I have a whole, or at one point, I had a whole bunch of pictures just like this one, and my friends would all make fun of me. So why are you taking pictures of those fish? And it's like, because I love this fish. Look at this fish. This is a wild fish. He was like born three weeks ago or something. And I caught that fish. I started looking for the toughest spot on the river. And a lot of those spots, you got one shot. And you got to stand on your left leg and tilt your head and close one eye and cast over here. You got one shot to get that cast in the right spot. And if you do, you're going to hook a really pretty fish out of a really tough spot. And if you miss it, you get up in that tree and you're trying to you know, unsag it, that fish is gone. So now i got to go back tomorrow and get my one shot in that one spot until I, until I beat that spot. So I started challenging myself in that way. I started looking for other types of species to catch. Uh, and, you know, so I started looking, looking for stuff like this. Uh, other options, smallmouth bats are really big on the fly. A lot of people love that. Carp is becoming really big. Now, that's a big deal out in Europe for years and years and years. But you're going you're to find people fly fishing for carp. Uh, other than that, you kind of have to go to other, I mean, out in Kansas, people are fly fishing for catfish, if you believe that. Uh, other than that, you kind of have to do a little bit of traveling, you know, to look for new species to catch on the fly rod. Uh, and I also like to just go out just to experience things, just kind of witness things that I haven't seen before. So what, what kind of sign fish was that? That's a, that was an actual bluegill. Yeah, watch this guy here. So I saw him on the current river, and so I started videotaping him and just walking toward him. And I, I was trying to get a shot of him taking off and flying away, just kind of add my collection of video shots, and he, and he turned, started walking away, and he was like, well, I'm going to get this little snack here before I fly off. And uh, that, that guy's my hero. Right there. That's, that's, I really know that. But I've, got, I've had all kinds of experience that I don't have on tape. Um, I was in the river one time, and I heard some rustling in, in the bushes, and I looked up just in time to see an otter take off like Superman into the river. Uh, I've had, uh, I had a deer jump in the river and swim over to me because she was being chased by some coyotes, and she just hang out, hung out with me for like an hour. I've had all kinds of really cool experiences. Now, oddly enough, whenever I have a cool experience, nine times out of ten, my video camera's battery is dead, or I don't have it with me. But uh, just trust me. You just got to trust me with all these stories. So the next step for me was it's time for me to start teaching other people how to do this because I'm having such a great time with this. And the first person that made sense for me to teach was my son. And that's him with the first two trout that he ever caught all by himself, tying on the lure, casting them out, catching them. He's about three years old. A huge Elmo fan. There he is, actually starting to look a little bit like a grown up. I also put up the website, Missouri Trout Hunter, and that's been up about, uh, oh, about the time I started guiding, about the time that the website went up. And uh, the reason why the website went up is because the Department of Conservation's website was terrible. They have almost no real trout fishing information. Uh, so, you know, I, I took it upon myself to put it out there. My thought being that I put some ads on there and maybe earn some gas money. And instead, it kind of like sent me in a completely different path with my life and uh, changed my, my career and, and everything for the better. Started guiding people. So, one, and it's, and since I still love fly fishing, don't get me wrong, but it's more fun for me to stand there with somebody and talk them through what they're supposed to do, tell them where to cast, tell them what fly we're putting on, explain why we're doing that, and watch you catch a fish and get to take a picture like that. Look how happy they guys are. They paid me $200 to catch that fish. That's the, but that, to me, is more fun than actually catching that fish myself. Because I can go out and catch 20 or 30 fish whenever I go out, but somebody who's struggling with it, to get them out there and show them what to do and see them have success is, is really a neat experience. 
that's Rico. He's a, uh, he was a foreign exchange student from Brazil. Now he's just Brazilian. He's back home. Uh, but before that day happened, uh, he's never held a firearm before. And I've also taught classes with you know, younger kids. 8 to 12 is a good age to, for kids to start learning how to fly fish. And I've also taught plenty of adults how to fly fish. Uh, I sat down and tried to figure it out. And uh, my best estimate is that I've introduced somewhere between 800 and 850 people to fly fishing over the years. I'm, I'm shooting for a thousand. Let's take out. I've written a bunch of articles. And yet, I continue to get bored because I've got what I think of as uh, fishing ADHD. I just I, I need to be doing something new all the time. So uh, when, I, when I start getting bored with one area, I just start looking for something to, to add to it and mix it up a little bit. So I started looking for adventures. Now, th these things didn't all happen in this order. They all kind of like have overlap and happen at different times. So I originally started going for adventures in my uh, 20s. That's me on the Frank Pan River in my uh, George Michael Wham days. And that stonewashed denim, oh, I tell you, they don't make it like they used to. Used to go out to Colorado with a black canyon. That was a lot of fun. That's from my first trip to Alaska. That's from my last trip to Alaska. And then you get to the point where it's like, okay, who else can I share this with? How can I spread this around a little bit? I'm, I'm experiencing all of this wonderful stuff. I gotta let other people know about it. So, in addition to guiding people in Missouri, I started taking people up to Alaska with me. We'll go up every September. Someone always asks, what the heck is that thing? Well, that's, that's a pink salmon, uh, which is the salmon that you can buy at, you know, at, the, at the grocery store uh, most of the time. Uh, except this one's all voided out and ready for spawning, so he's not worth eating. He's, uh, he's kind of messed up meat-wise, but they're a lot of fun to catch. That one's a chum salmon. There's my son looking even a little bit more like a grown-up with a pretty good-sized sockeye. And a big old scrape on the fish is actually bear damage. So this fish survived the bear attack, and then got killed by a teenager. So I mean, they've got to kill you for a fish. So that's, that's my journey. That's what got me to this point here. Uh, and then, uh, so this, this is the next stage of that. Uh, you know, just let everybody know as much as possible about, about where I've gone with this and, and uh, uh, to try to encourage people to continue their own journey. To, to, you know, as soon as you're bored, do something different, keep moving along. But, uh, but the purpose of what we're, uh, the reason why we're here, what we're talking about today, is, is how to be the trout, how to get around uh, all of the misconceptions that there are about trout. Uh, because if, uh, if, if when, when I first started fishing for trout, I could catch the heck out of a blue beetle. I could catch all kinds of uh, catfish and whatnot. And I was just sure that I was a good fish or a good fisherman, but, but trout just were really tough to finally get the hang of. So what that does is that causes cognitive dissonance which is a psychological term for when you have two thoughts that contradict each other in your head. So for me, and for a lot of people, it's, I'm a good fisherman, but I'm not catching any trout. So the logical thing to do here is to recognize one of those two statements can't be 100% true. I need to change my beliefs because they're contradicting each other, and uh, if I'm not willing to do that, then I have to add a new thought or uh, change the rules of the game in some ways so that I can hold on to my two sacred beliefs here. So they can't both be true, so I've got a mistake somewhere, or there's got to be a way that these are both true. So the way that most people add the extra thought to try to like, get rid of that uh, contradiction, trout must be smart. I mean, I, I, over the years I've heard a lot of people say that trout has got to be smart. I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> And, uh, and incidentally, uh, I've got new, my, my first book, finally, I've been working on it for 10 years, it's going to be coming out here in the next month or two, and I'll give you three guesses what the title of the book is. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the, it's the uh, foundation of my trout fishing philosophy. And whenever I go fishing, my, uh, what I preach to people is, step one is catch all the stupid fish first, uh, because they don't have much of a brain, they're, they're basically as dumb as a bag of doorknobs. This fish right here, this is a heck of a nice fish. I caught this fish at Miramax Spring Park, which I don't normally fish in the trout parks. But, uh, but I had a client 
that wanted to stay in the river once our guide trip was done. And so I was leaving without him. And I'm walking into the park, and, and as I'm walking through the park, I was like, look at the size of that fish. And so I went and I bought a tag, and I went back down to that fish, and I harassed this fish for darn near an hour. I threw every fly at this fish I could, and I snagged her at one point, snagged her in the tail, and she swam off all over the place, and finally just broke the fly off to give her a little, uh, you, know, you know, kind of ease, ease up on her a little bit. And she took off, and I thought that was over with. And then she came right back and sat right there in front of me again. So I cast at her again for another 10 minutes. I finally picked the fly that she ate, and I caught that fish. That's a dumb fish. Um, and when I started, when I finally hooked that fish and she was thrashing around, I started kind of developing a little bit of a crowd. People kind of started kind of walking over and looking at me, which that's one reason why I hate the trout park. They don't like the whole, you know, on display sort of thing. And I was kind of, was kind of embarrassed because it was like, wow, man, look at that fish. Nice job. And it was like, no, this is just a dumb fish. I had drifted a fly into her mouth. So, so yeah, that is a dumb fish. Now, the reason why she was so, so uh, uneducated, let's say, is because she probably stopped in the river the day before. So she had zero life experience. She didn't recognize any threat. So if I was to catch that fish out on the river in a real wild setting, that fish has been in the river for a few years, and she learned that moving shadows and sudden sounds might be dangerous if she would have been up underneath that root line, that still doesn't make her smart. So trout don't have a cerebral cortex. When I say the word brain, the image you picture, all that gray wrinkly stuff, that's the cerebral cortex, and they don't have it. All they have is the inner brain. So they can still learn, but they learn by trial and error, where they learn by observation. But they, they don't have the ability to engage in that multi-stage clinical problem solving. So human beings can do that. Not that we always do, because sometimes we're stupid too. But the multi-stage clinical problem solving is, I've got a problem. What could possibly be causing my problem? Here's my list of possible causes. What are some things I could possibly do to address those causes? Here's my list of possible solutions. Which one makes the most sense for me to try first? What's going to be easiest? What's you know, possibly going to fix the cause? The most you can make logical decisions based on that, and you do it to solve the problem. Trout can't do that. You trout see the shadow, they either run or they don't. They make the right decision, they live, make the wrong decision, they die. If they live, they repeat the behavior. That's essentially it. But this is interesting. A few years ago, there was a study, at, well, it wasn't a study. Uh, but it was a paper uh, published at a university in England, and it was a, a fisheries biology class. And part of what they did every year is they would study sticklebacks, which is just a little fish. And, and part of the coursework was they would take sticklebacks, and they would put them in a tank, and they had little feeders with the little rods hanging down in the water, and they would study how long it took the fish to figure out which rod gave them food and which rods didn't give them food. And, and so it was just like an like a exercise and research. Well, what they discovered this one semester was that suddenly they started having all these fish, they put them in the tank, and they swim right over to the correct rod and hit it immediately. It was like, well, how the heck are they doing that? Did we suddenly get a batch of psychic fish? Well, no, one of the students inadvertently moved the two tanks together. So these fish were observing the study, and they were seeing where the food was coming from, and then they put them over there, and they'd go right there. That was the first documented case where fish, we could, sh we could show that fish learn the behavior by watching the fish. So that's kind of cool. So that leads me to trap mythology, though, because there's a whole list of them. And, and a lot of these you'll agree with, and some of them you might not. So if anybody wants to argue with me, you might want to wait until afterwards so I don't embarrass you in front of you. Uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of them that, that look familiar to you, things that you've believed in the past that now you know is not true, and there's going to be some that, are, that might surprise you. So trout are smart. We already talked about that. Trout are picky eaters. So this one comes from uh, advice that over the years I have received from people that if you're going to bait fish, you got to make sure that the point of the hook is hidden inside the kernel of corn or the salmon egg or, or the dough bait or whatever, because if they see the hook, they won't bite. That sort of thing. Uh, or if you're going to fly fish, you got to match the bug just absolutely exactly perfect. Otherwise, they won't bite. And almost never is that the case. Trout, by and large, are just kind of opportunistic feeders. If they see something that looks like food, they're either going to eat it with reckless abandon or they're going to taste it, or if they don't eat it, then they're just looking for something different. So that pickiness is not really the issue that we're talking about. Trout like cold water. Trout are actually cold blooded. And what that means is that they don't care what the water temperature is. If the water temperature is 
40 degrees, the fish is 40 degrees, and we're fine with that. If it's 70 degrees, the fish is 70 degrees, and we're fine with that too. What trout like about cold water is that cold water has more oxygen. The temperature and the oxygen content are inversely related. As water warms up, it pushes the oxygen out. So when that water temperature gets up around 75 degrees, they're having trouble breathing. Now, because they're cold-blooded, as the water warms up, they're warming up, the respiration goes up, the lower needs go up, everything goes up, so they're burning more calories, they need more food. So you've got this fish that's starving to death, but can't breathe well enough to feed. That's the reason why they thrive in cold water, but they don't have a preference for cold water. Therefore, when somebody says that the fish swim upstream looking for the spring, well, they don't, because number one, they're not smart enough to know that a spring exists or where the spring is. And uh, number two, the only reason to look for the spring would be because the water's colder. Well, actually, spring water, in most cases, unless it's coming out of a cave, it's got a lower oxygen content than river water does. So a fish that's right at the spring is actually going to be a little bit more lethargic than one that's a quarter mile downstream. So they're not looking for the spring. Now, they like to swim upstream, but that's just because fish like to swim upstream. It's kind of like if you're standing out on a field and there's this big, huge gust of wind, we tend to turn into it, kind of lean into it, fish do the same thing. When the current increases, they swim against it. Trout aren't hungry when the water's too warm. Now, uh, where this comes from is I've heard a lot of guides and I've read a lot of articles where uh, people are, are coached that when the water's really warm, that you should use little flies. And, uh, and I've also heard like, the logic behind that being that you know, if you were out mowing the lawn and it was 95 degrees, you're not going to want to go inside and have a pizza. You're going to go inside and have like a little salad and some fruit or something light, you know, because it's so so hot outside, you know, it's comfortable. Well, we're warm blooded, they're cold blooded, so that doesn't apply. The warmer the water, the hungrier they are. So I went I went fishing. One of my trips to to uh, Colorado uh, was when I was <clears throat> excuse me when I was in college. And, uh, and I went out there in August to fish with a buddy of mine who was going to school in, in Boulder. And it was just god awful hot. And we fished for a couple of days and we just couldn't catch hardly a thing. And so we were getting ready to call it quits and we decided, you know what, let's give it one more day. We were camping. Let's give it one more day. Let's just tie up some random crazy flies and we'll just see if, uh, see if something happens. And so we tied up a bunch of silly stuff. And some of the flies that I tied up were like two inch long mutant cockroach looking things with rubber legs hanging all over. I mean, they were silly. They were silly. And my buddy was making fun of me, but you know, we were making fun of each other because neither one of us were doing any good. Well, the next day, that was the fly of the day. That, I mean, we just absolutely tore him up with that fly. And we ended up staying another four days, and I don't know how many fish we caught on that huge, giant fly. And it took me a while to kind of figure out that maybe it had something to do with how hot the water was. Because that bug, that fly did not match any bug in that river, except for maybe a stone fly. But the stone flies were about half that size of the ground. So, essentially, what I was seeing there is... These fish with high metabolism were hungry and starving to death and, and low on oxygen, so they couldn't really you know, pursue things. So how am I going to get that fish to move out of his current position to bite something? Well, it's got to have tons of calories. So by, by making it such a huge fly, I got that fish to broaden how far he was willing to move to take that fly. Now, I hate to think how many of those fish died because we like, wore them out and put them back into a low oxygen environment with even fewer calories than they had before, but yeah, I was young and stupid. We had fun that day though. Now this is one that a lot of times I get arguments with, uh, get arguments about, is that trout have excellent eyesight. Now I mentioned that I've done some taxidermy. One of the things that I've heard a million times is somebody would bring me a fish <coughs> and they would say, nobody else was catching anything, but I caught this fish because I was using that monofilament sewing thread from the Walmart fabric store, and that's the only reason I caught it, because the fish could see everybody else's line, but they couldn't see my line. Well, there's a couple things here. Uh, number one, they really don't have good eyesight. And the way that we know that is because people who are getting their advanced degrees in fisheries biology, they have to do research to you know, prove their thesis and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the, one, a, a very uh, popular uh, thesis sort of project to do is to dissect the eyeballs and actually put the retinas underneath the microscope and see how tightly packed together the rods and cones are. The more tightly packed together they are, the higher the uh, uh, resolution that they can see. So an eagle's retina, their rods and cones are about 10 times more tightly packed together than us. And eagle's eyesight is you know, very much, much more acute than our eyesight is. Our rods and cones are 14 times more tightly packed than a trout's. So their eyesight is much worse than ours. 
They also don't have any kind of special coating on anything. You know how you put on a scuba mask or something and you look in the water and everything's clear and kind of sharp? They don't have any kind of coating like that that gives them that benefit. So when you go underwater with, without goggles on and everything's a little fuzzed out, that's how they see that's their normal vision. That's the reason why I can wrap some yarn on my rope and tie a feather on there and they think it's a bug. It's not, they don't have that perfect eyesight like a lot of people tend to get. The other kicker though is that they're not smart. So even if they do see your line, they're not smart enough to recognize that as dangerous. And we already kind of touched on this one, trophy size traveler extra smart. Well actually, the way that a fish becomes a trophy is by being the biggest chicken in the river. A leaf flutters and casts a shadow. The one trout that freaks out and hits that root wad, he's the one that's going to grow up. All the rest of them, ah, it's just a leaf. Well, at some point in time, that just a leaf is going to be an otter, and he's not going to survive. Or it's going to be a fisherman, and he's not going to survive. But that one that's the biggest chicken, he's the one that's going to grow up. And at some point in time, they reach the point where they're now the dominant predator in that stretch of river, and they no longer feel afraid. And I've seen that happen before. I'll see a big old fish, and you can like walk over to it, almost kick it. He'll stay away from you, and he'll eventually leave. But he kind of begins to lose his fear of you. Uh, now, since otters have been reintroduced into Missouri rivers, that's begun to go away because, you know, otters obviously, they'll eat that fish. So those fish are learning a different lesson now. And trout migrate looking for the spawning grounds. This, this one comes from uh, Discovery Channel, you know, where the salmon, they disappear into the ocean and a few years later they come back and somehow magically they find their way to the exact spot where they were born. Uh, well, that's actually... Uh, uh, a load of garbage. <laughs> a lot of them do, but uh, a lot of that is luck. So it's not an instinctual sort of thing. When when the current increases, when they feel the current, they naturally go against that current. So what happens with salmon is they hit the salt water, they work the ocean currents in the Pacific, for example, and then around the same time of year, as they as they work that that circuit, they'll feel. They'll, first of all, they have an awesome sense of smell. They'll smell home kind of gets their attention. And then in the summertime, before all the salmon runs happen, the rains start happening, the current goes up, and that, that flow from those rivers increases and steers them right up those rivers. And it's about an 80% success rate when you get somewhere close to home. But salmon end up in the wrong rivers all the time. Where I take people is uh, Prince of Wales Island. There are no king salmon runs on the entire island. But every year, people accidentally catch king salmon in those rivers. They don't spawn them. It's just some odd, random salmon that just happened to swim up the wrong river because it kind of smelled like home. <laughs> now, uh, with rainbow trout, it's exactly the same thing. Or brown trout, it's exactly the same thing. You just take the ocean out of the equation. So, it starts raining in the spring, the rivers come up, they migrate, and then about the time when it's time to spawn, they just happen to be where they're supposed to be. So uh, as far as rainbow trout in Missouri, that's one thing that people are surprised about a lot is about spawning uh, trout in Missouri. Uh, Department of Conservation has two different strains that they raise. One is a fall spawning rainbow trout, one is a spring spawning rainbow trout. The reason they do that, it's genetically engineered that way. One of the reasons they did that is so that they would have trout that they could stock year round. Um, but we also have wild trout that where their dominant genetic uh, code for spawning comes from uh, McLeod River red band trout from California from you know, the late 1800s. And that, that gene is still really dominant in all of our trout. So the hatchery trout that spawned will eventually crossbreed with a, you know, one of those wild trout that has that McLeod gene in there. And suddenly they stop spawning in the spring or the fall. And so now they start spawning sometime between late December and early January. That's when the McLeod trout spawn. So we've actually got three different spawning seasons that'll happen in Missouri for rainbow trout. But when the fall rains have come up and, and the rivers come up, they'll migrate. And wherever they end up when it's time to spawn, that's where they do it. And in the spring, rains come up, they migrate. When it's time to spawn, they do it where they are. And, and that's it. It's all luck. So this is the payoff. There's four different styles of feeding behavior you're going to see a trout um, engage in. And the first one is aggressively feeding. So everybody has seen that. You throw out a rooster tail or something that chases it across the river to try to kill it. So as a fly fisherman, if I don't know what's going on in the river, I'm going to target the aggressively feeding trout first. I'm going to test them. I'm going to see how aggressive they're going to be. So I'm going to cast out a fly that I can retrieve. So typically that's streamer fishing. I'll cast it out. I'll sink it. I'll strip it in. And I'll start off by stripping it in really aggressively. Big, long, fast strips. And I'll see if the trout are going to chase it. 
If they don't chase it right off the bat, or if they chase it, then they'll take it on again to slow down my retreat. Or I might swing it across current without retrieving it all, retrieving it at all. But I'm testing their aggressiveness. If that doesn't work, then I'm going to change my tactic. And I'm going to I'm going to test to see if they're feeding opportunistically. And you've all seen this too. Uh, an opportunistically feeding trout doesn't matter if it's real food. It's big, it's visible, it looks like it might be edible, they're going to taste it. And so I'm going to throw out big, obvious, colorful, goofy looking flies, kind of like that big giant mutant cockroach fly I did in Colorado all those years ago, just to see if they're going to feed opportunistically. So everybody has seen a glow bug or a glow ball, whatever you want to call it. There's all kinds of different flies like that. One of the big, one right, big ones right now is called a mop fly because uh, it was invented. Somebody bought one of those, those you know, rope mops and cut it up and tied it onto a hook and said, holy cow, that worked. I can't believe it. There's all kinds of flies like that where they've never seen anything like that before. Or maybe they've seen something kind of like that before. And so they're going to taste it. And uh, if they're feeding aggressively or opportunistically, you're going to have a lot of fun. And if, if they're doing that and I'm the guy, I'm really excited because we're going to get a lot of good pictures. But if that's not going to work, then you're probably looking at fish that are passively feeding in one way or another, or, or naturally feeding in one way or another. And what that means is they're still feeding, but they're only feeding on things that they recognize, things that they have seen before. And it doesn't have to be an exact match, but it has to look like one. This is when you're going to get into your fly box, and you're going to start going through all of the natural looking traditional trout flies. Now, if you take some time, the next time you go to whatever river you're fishing, if you take some time and get into some ripples and start turning over rocks or putting down you know, a, a little fine-grained net and picking up some sediment attacks and take a look at the bugs, that's going to show you what you should have in your box. So when you pull up a nymph that's about this size and about that color, you're going to want to have a, a, a fly that kind of looks like that. Whether it's uh, mayflies, caddisflies, scuds, midges, well, you're going to have a hard time actually seeing the midges, but you can assume that they're there. So, but uh, what you want to do is you want to have some understanding of what kind of bugs those fish are actually seeing in that river so that you know what you should have in your box. And then you just get in your box and you start trying them out. See if they, see if they have any preferences. I personally tend to start with the biggest fly, natural looking fly, in my box. I gradually get smaller and smaller. The, the reason I do that, well, there's two reasons. I hate trying to tie on those stinking little tiny flies. I hate that. Uh, I, do they make quad focals? But, uh, so I hate that. Uh, but the uh, the logical reason to do it that way is that the bigger flies are going to be easier to see. So if you're passively feeding and they'll eat a size 10 stonefly or a size 26 midge, this was one I would rather tie on. I'm going to want to tie on the big, you know, the big stonefly, and also they're going to have an easier time seeing that and attacking that. But let's say that that doesn't work. And maybe they're feeding selectively. Now this is where people begin to think that trout are picky, and they're not really picky. What's happening when a trout is feeding selectively, probably there's a hatch going on or a hatch getting ready to happen. And when there's a major hatch where there's one primary bug that's getting ready to come off the water, uh, what you're seeing, what they're seeing, is they're seeing aquatic insects swim from the gravel to the surface to try to hatch out and, and fly away. But most of the time, that bug doesn't hatch immediately. There are some species where the whole thing takes them 20 minutes, whoosh, gone. But most bugs will swim up and realize, ah, I wasn't quite ready yet, and so they'll swim back down. So there's this cloud of bugs swimming up and down, and the trout start picking at them. And they know that it's food, because when they bite on it, it's soft and squishy and tastes good. And everything else just becomes part of the background noise. It all becomes part of the static. So when you catch something that doesn't look like that, it's not that they look at it and say, mm, no, I really prefer this. It's that they're just not even seeing it. It's just, it's just clutter. It's debris, it's whatever. They've, they've just learned to, to ignore it and to disengage from all of that because there's real stuff that's driven by that they can actually eat. If, it's, if, it, if you're still not getting hits, there's a couple of different reasons why you may not be getting hits. Maybe they're not feeding at all. So on the Merrimack River, there are certain times of year where we have some really big overnight hatches and uh, like pretty amazing overnight hatches. So if you go fishing at first light, those fish are full. So during those times of year, I go in the afternoon, and usually as I'm pulling into a little parking area, wherever it happens to be, I see people leaving, and I know they're leaving thinking, man, the fish stunk this morning. And I'm like trying to fight them, no, 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 wait, wait, don't go, you're going too early, you need to stick out. And uh, but that's really typical, is that just during those times of year, fish is better in the afternoon. Maybe they're spooky, the water's really low, really still, low flow, uh, you know, just just your line, slapping the water hard to scoop the fish, any kind of 
sudden sound, sudden movement, sudden shadows can spook the fish. So if they're just kind of nervous in general, anything that's not nice and calm and placid sends them into that root and allows them to take off. And it could be your fault. Maybe you're walking too fast, stumbling around, wading in too far, too, you know, too aggressive with your casting. Or they might need some help with you finding the fly. Now, uh, when I say this, we're talking about that whole thing about there being debris in the water, kind of like what I mentioned before, when they can kind of key in on certain things that are, that are uh, um, food and certain things that are not. So what I did here is I just took my camera and I put it down in the current and I'm just kind of like moving it around like a trap. This part of the river is only a couple of feet deep and it's gin clear. So this is what they're seeing. See how murky it is in the water? That's because the light scatters and hits the water. So the visibility is not great. And if you look at it, you see all the debris and everything that's, that's going past them. So this is their full-time job, is just looking back and forth and trying to pick out of all that debris something that's edible. And if they see something that might be edible, usually they'll taste it. And if it's not edible, it comes right back out. So the way that you defeat this is there's a couple of things that you can do. You can, do, you can use two flies on the same rig. Loud, not just fly first, and then something more natural afterwards. And they'll see that big fly, and they'll line up, and they'll inspect it. And then if they either choose to eat it or they don't, now they're in position for your more natural fly that's going to drift right along by. So that helps them pick out food out of all of this mud. The other thing that you can do is you can prove to them that your fly is not debris, and the way that you can do that is you can add some motion to it. So the most common way to do that is called swinging your fly. Steelhead fishermen do this all the time. And the reason why steelhead fishermen do it is because a steelhead run, kind of like a salmon run, they're coming from the ocean, but they don't usually come in in vast numbers. They come in individually, and so there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. And they don't generally hang out in a feeding line and everything. They, uh, uh, they're just kind of like they're scattered and they're not strange. So to show, them, to show their fly to as many fish as possible, they swing it across the current so they can show it to all the fish in that stretch. But what we want it to do for the trap here is is we want to cast across the current, maybe downstream a little bit, and sink that fly, straighten out your line so, you're, so it's not whip cracking around, just so it's nice and gentle, swing across the current. And if you're the fish in the current, what I want you to see is I want you to see the fly coming from deep to the surface across your field of vision just like that. And what that tells you when you're trying to look through all of that debris, what that tells you is that for sure is not debris. I should go check that out. And you just kind of wade downstream. Do a couple of swings, cast, cast either straight across, a little down, a little down. You get some different presentations, take two or three big mom steps downstream, do it again. And you just work that whole stretch. And sooner or later, you're going to find a trout that's going to follow along. And when you just let it sit there for a second, it'll come up and grab it. Or it's going to do one of those three stooges moments, it's going to slap them upside the head and it'll snap at it. So those are the two things you can do to defeat, defeat all of that debris. Does that make sense? Have got any questions for me? None at all? Man, I did great. <laughs> You're talking yes. about the uh, trout parks. Um, I don't know if I'll say so, but on the very side. Do you have any favorite for wild trout? Is there some rivers that are in that location? For wild trout? Yeah. Uh, my favorite wild trout river in the entire state is Little Pony Creek, which is about half an hour south of Raleigh. Mm -hmm. It is the most consistent wild trout population. Uh, my second best, my second favorite would be Crane Creek, which is over southwest of Springfield. And that's one of that's one, one of only a few locations in the world where you can still catch a, a pure strain of cloud red man, red man trout. But that fishing is really great too. Anybody else? So on the honey, yeah. excuse me, on honey, you go near Lane Springs, is that where you put it in? Or? Well, there's a couple of places you can go. Uh, when you, get, when you go in at Lane Springs, you're up there in the blue ribbon section, so that's all wild, and you can keep one fish 18 inches or longer. Nobody ever can keep fish out of here, but that's, that's the regulation. Further downstream, which is actually going north, which feels weird, but north is downstream, uh, is the white ribbon section, and they stock that every few weeks throughout the year, and you can keep four, four fish there. Uh, most of the locals that go there, they just bait fish or throw rooster tails or something like that, but the fly fishing is there is pretty good. Yeah, I tend to go in at lane spring, I tend to go down spring at lane spring. Anybody else? All right, well, I've got, uh, I've got uh, some flyers over here if you want to grab one business card. Uh, there's a place where you can sign up to get on my email list if you like. Uh, I promise I won't harass you too much with my emails. Uh, 
thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I'll be around. Come out and see me. You have to answer any questions. Yeah.